Um, today, today we have the pleasure of one of our own addressing us, which I think is um, a big part of what we do as well. Peter, would you like to tell us your story, sir? We would love to hear it. Now, I've lost my microphone, so I need you to talk. You do need a microphone. You do need a microphone. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're not going to hold this for the whole talk. Good morning, everyone. This unnecessary implement will be tolerated. What, what, I, what, I will in, what I will try and do today is give you a sort of a helicopter view of Peter John Castleton's life, which is what I think these talks are meant to be, to give you an idea of where we came from and what we've done, uh, even though I was described as some decrepit old... <laughs> Um, I became a twinkle in my mother and father's eye somewhere around the 16th of October 1945 when my father was called back to his aircraft carrier in the Pacific um, quickly and my, he'd known my mother for eight weeks and they decided that they'd get married before he went. So very much a wartime baby boomer story. On the 15th of July the next year I was born, if you want to calculate that out, Tony, you'll find that it's about nine months to the knocker. <laughs> so a very lucky entry into the world to, of, of legitimacy. Uh, my father was a British naval officer. He was the commander engineering on the British battle group that came into the Pacific after the end of the war in Europe. A lot of people don't realise, but most of the American carriers had been sunk or severely damaged in that part of the war because the Americans, being the Americans, thought more of the tyres on their aircraft than on the armour plate of their flight decks. So the American carriers all had wooden flight decks and so the kamikazes had a field day. So five British carriers, led by the Furious and the Illustrious, came into um, the Pacific to be part of the fight back. They were under the command of uh, Halsey and Nimitz. Uh, they had a British flag officer. My father was the commander engineering of the battle group uh, and he looked after the engine rooms and all of the aircraft hangars and that sort of thing. Um, he got wounded at Guadalcanal, met Mum, who was a nurse at the old Diamantina. Those of you who are old enough remember the old Diamantina hospital behind where the PA is now. Uh, they met at a ball and eight weeks later they were married and I arrived nine months later. Six months, uh, six months old, my parents decided, or my mother decided, she wanted to be closer to my father and the war looked like it was moving to, towards the end. I think the atomic bomb had been dropped pretty well, 15th of July, so just after that they dropped the atomic bomb. We, we went to England and I lived there for the next five years. I don't remember much about that, um, although I have been a frequent visitor back to the United Kingdom since and lived there twice. We came back to Nowra, HMAS Albatross. Those of you who know anything about aviation, HMAS Albatross was the fleet air arm base when Australia had aircraft carriers, two of them. and. Uh, Gannett aircraft and Sea Furies and uh, later on vampires and things like that. <coughs> we lived there for a number of years. My brother was born there, then moved back to Brisbane where I was actually born in the women's hospital. I grew up, uh, went to Manly State School, um, had a wonderful childhood because my grandfather was the senior station master on the line between Brisbane and Redland Bay which in those days was steam and the old diesel rail motors. So I grew up on the, uh, the engine plate of a lot of steam engines and locomotives because in those days workplace health and safety was a common sense thing and people were allowed to do that providing you supervised. So I had a wonderful induction in steam. I can still drive a steam engine, which I proved here a few months ago when the, that American engine they've got down in the General MacArthur they've got in the museum came up here and the bloke said, well, come up and show me, can you move this engine? And I let the brake off pulled the throttle lever, opened the steam valves and the train took a bit of a lurch forward. <laughs> I'd say it was a lurch, it wasn't a smooth. Yeah, that's right. Well, I'm now, early next year, I'm enrolling in a course, which I think I did mention at one of the meetings, to actually become a qualified steam engine driver. I think that could be a really good end to my career. Because they are fabulous machines. They are absolutely amazing machines, to me anyway. Um, I went to uh, Wynnum High. I had spent uh, a year at uh, 
Church of England Grammar School, which I had to get up at five o'clock in the morning, get the steam train to Buranda, because I grew up at Manly in the Bayside. I then had to walk, because I ran out of pocket money generally Tuesday. I had then had to walk to Churchy, which was then down the bottom end of Buranda, or still is. Um, hated it because there were no girls, so I rebelled and my parents succumbed to my uh, arguments and let me go to Wynnum High where there were girls and a reasonably good standard of education. Wynnum High and State High were then part of the GPS, the greatest public school sports thing. So it was, they were quite a nice transitional school in terms of where you fitted into the pecking order. Um, I did not go to university, I went straight into the military. So hence when I e emailed Steve the other day, I said I'd use pinch from Smiley's, uh, uh, John le Carre's novel, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, because that sort of describes my, my career. Um, I went into the military, was commissioned on the uh, uh, 15th, of September, uh, 15th of February 1980, no, not 65, and at that time was the youngest officer in the Australian Army. Not for much longer because then all the Vietnam stuff and everything took over and people were going in as soon as they left school. And, uh, but for about nine months I was the youngest sub-lieutenant in the Royal Australian Infantry in the Australian Army, having sort of gone through the officer cadet training program. Uh, I really enjoyed that but didn't see it as being the be all and end all of my career. Uh, I was posted to the 9th Battalion here in Brisbane uh, as a platoon commander, it was a platoon commander long enough of one platoon A company, uh, which was the, the senior sub-lieutenant's position without wishing to be too immodest. And we were given our colours, which were laid up in St John's Cathedral two weeks ago, and Geraldine and I went down for that service to meet up with the Owls and Bowls. What does that mean, laid up? The colours of a unit uh, list all your battle honours. There's the Queen's colour and the regimental colour. They have all your battle honours, and the 9th Battalion was at the Boer War. That's how old it was. It was the Spring Hill and Fortitude Valley Rifles in those days, a very old unit within the Australian Army, um, if, or one of the oldest. And at the end of the uh, useful life of the colours, and when the Queen decides, through Paul de Jersey, to give the unit a new set of colours, because there are new, some new battle honours since Afghanistan and what have you, uh, you get a new set and you lay the old set up in a cathedral. So there was a big parade in Brisbane, the uh, battalion exercised its right of freedom of the city and marched through with flags flying, drums beating and bayonets fixed. So it's a bit, bit of military nonsense, but I quite like that sort of thing. And the, the, the colours are now laid up in St John's Cathedral. And they alternate between the Catholic and the Angl Anglican cathedrals where they go. Um, one night my father called me, because I was living independently then, and in my <coughs> or late teens, 20s actually, early 20s, um, and said, uh, just had an approach, because he moved on from his military or his naval career, came out to Australia and became the chief engineer of what was then called the Department of Supply in Australia, and he based himself in Brisbane because that's where Mum wanted to live. And he said, I've been approached uh, about a, a possible uh, job offer for you. And I said, well, I've already got a job, I'm a soldier. Yeah. I then went through a series of interviews with a fellow called Ken Donovan, uh, and uh, subsequently found out that he was the Queensland Regional Director of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, which I subsequently joined four months later as a career officer, uh, as what they called a cadetship in those days, which is very much like the old Commonwealth cadetship that applied to a whole range of departments. Um, I went into that about the time of, well, the time of the Vietnam War. Uh, New Yin Kai Ki came to Australia, Lyndon Johnson came to Australia. There was a very exciting time to be there and I guess the pinnacle of that part of my career was I was running what's called the Yugoslav desk, in other words, the desk that looked at running sources within the Yugoslav, the Croatian Serbians, Montenegrins, the various other ethnic groupings that make up what's called Yugoslavia. Uh, at the time when B Tito died and Prime Minister Bjadic came to Australia and there was great concern at that time, now if I look back I'd probably say unwarranted, that some mad Croatian was going to kill him, you know, was going to assassinate him. <laughs> well, they are pretty fiery. But we, ha we had a method, we, had a we, we fixed that, we, we did fix that, I'll tell you in a second. Um, that was quite an interesting period because I had to coordinate people right around Australia without computers, because we didn't have computers in those days, we had a thing called a telex. 
That's how old I am, but it was wonderful. And of course, you couldn't use the telephone network because it was insecure. But anyway, we didn't do a bad job. And the way we did that is police departments in each state at that time had special branches. And the special branches were subsequently abolished by the Second Hope Royal Commission as being too political, and being honest, they were, um, and political to the government of the day. But the special branches, with our officers identifying the troublemakers, went out and took fiery Croatians and some Serbs who are also quite fiery, you might know Steve, uh, into protective custody for the seven days covering the five-day period Beodic was here. So all this nonsense they carry on with today about uh, freedom and rights and what have you, in those days we had the power of seven-day detention, providing the Chief Justice uh, of the High Court gave that position and signed the warrant. So we actually took the troublemakers for a little holiday for seven days at the at Her Majesty's expense. We did not mistreat them. I'd like to emphasise that. We did not mistreat them. Uh, they were looked after pretty well. They had to sing their revolutionary songs if they weren't allowed to throw petrol bombs or fire rifles at uh, Mr Bjadic. Uh, that was quite a fascinating part of my career. And then uh, the then Deputy Director General Colin Brown uh, asked to see me in Melbourne and my immediate reaction was, shit, what have I done? <laughs> because that was the sort of culture in the organisation. And it was a very military organisation, ASIO, run by Brigadier Sir Charles Spry. He was the Director General at that time, soon to be replaced by Justice Sir Edward Woodward, uh, who was the Director General I worked most of my career for. Woodward had a long history in the Northern Territory and was, a chief, was chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Victoria, amongst other things, Chancellor of Melbourne University, and a delightful, very pleasant man to know. And what Colin Brown put to me was that there was a need for someone to go to Alice Springs. And I thought, God, I really have done something bad. Because <laughs> you know, here I was, 24 years of age, being asked to go to Alice Springs, you know, where I knew we didn't have an office. Anyway, it, it ended up being... <laughs> In other words, they were trying to get me as far away as possible, Steve. Um, and then it became revealed, because it was all extremely hush-hush, just better watch the time. Um, that there was a need, there was a belief that the Russians were trying, because this was right in the height of the Cold War, to actually penetrate the downlink signals from the satellites that are controlled from a place called Pine Gap, or more correctly, the Joint Defence Space Research Facility Pine Gap, which is about 22 kilometres outside of Alice Springs. Uh, I was appointed as an ASIO officer, but under a defence cover as the senior Australian on that base from the uh, 30th of June 1976 until the end of 1979, and I kept going back for the next four or five years, because it was quite a fascinating place, and uh, it, it runs a set, and you can, this is all public information now, and always was in the States, but not in Australia, runs a set of geostationary satellites, which means they're 35,000 miles out from the equator, around the equator, with antennas on each side the size of tennis courts made out of gold foil, made by a company called TRW in California that listened to every piece of electronic emission on this planet. The Americans collect every electronic emission on this planet. It comes down a downlink through Pine Gap, goes to a satellite over Guam and then straight into NSA headquarters just outside of Washington. They use a keyword system and they still use this. I occasionally go back to a reunion on the last Friday before Christmas in Washington at the CIA headquarters and uh, I've been back 14, 15 times altogether. I uh, haven't been for the last three or four years with my old friend and colleague, Hi Markham, who was the American head while I was there, sadly died of lung cancer a couple of years ago. But it was a fascinating period, absolutely amazing period. Uh, we, we could listen, the, the satellites were so sensitive, we could listen to the Israeli tank commanders in the Seven Day War talking to each other because they, their language of choice, because the Arabs couldn't understand it was English, they used to speak in English between their tanks and their aircraft, their Mirage squadrons and their uh, uh, Centurion battle tanks. And we listened, you could listen to all of that, individual conversations, and you could filter those out. So it was really a fascinating period. I then, that came to an end, and I could have extended, but decided for Geraldine's career's benefit, because she was a teacher then, and she had a teaching job, but wanted to move more back into the mainstream of teaching that I would accept the position of Regional Director in Adelaide. So I moved back or went to South Australia, 
because the logical progression in those days was from the Territory to Adelaide. So I went to Adelaide as the Regional Director of ASIO. Um, interesting place, a lot of people say, Adelaide, what's on there? Most Australian defence activity in terms of research, R&D, research and development, happens in South Australia. The space research or the uh, defence research facilities at Salisbury and beyond up to Woolmora where the testing ranges still are um, was really quite good. So it was actually quite a good posting. However, after what I'd been doing, it became fairly mundane. So at a period of time I became involved in community work and uh, was a volunteer on the board of the Spastic Centres of South Australia, which then ran the Australian Cerebral Palsy League and I was invited to become the CEO. So that was how I got out of government after a 15, 16 year career, for which I hasten to add I was given the ASIO medal in 2005 from saving you all from godless communism about the same time as the wall came down <laughs> and communism ceased to be a threat. But it was very nice to get that recognition uh, about, uh, there wasn't a huge number of uh, people in the organisation who got that medal, so something I did was recognised as being significant. Uh, probably voted for by the publicans of Australia who I'd supported very vigorously during those years. Um, the spastic centres were fascinating. I took over, a fellow called Brenton Wright sort of eased me in uh, to the role as he was moving out to become the Director General of the Department of Children's Services and I suddenly discovered that nobody gave us any money. We got some grants but they were for highly specific purposes and so therefore we had to raise the money to run the operation, something you know intimately, Mark. Um, and you know we had to compete for grants and things like that, but the actual basic function of the place was covered by fundraising, and mainly the Miss Australia Quest in those days. So we diversified into other areas like Superwalk, and we built that. I had a very pleasant five years there, when at that point Geraldine's asthma had developed to the stage that the her specialist said, we'll move out of the climate or put up with it. So we decided to move back to Queensland. Came back to Queensland, during those five years, I uh, got someone who named most of you will know, Everall Compton, to come in and do a, a fundraising feasibility study of the spastic centres and give us some advice. And he said to me just uh, one afternoon over a cup of tea, if you're ever looking for a job, give me a ring. So I did. <laughs> uh, I then became one of his consultants. Uh, first job was on a museum in Melbourne in the Chinese precinct, which was a sort of Chinese museum. That was reasonably successful. The chairman of it, funnily enough, was Don Dunstan, who I'd crossed swords with a few times because he was Premier of South Australia when I went there, but he was quite a different person to work for when he was working as the Tourist Commissioner in Victoria. Um, I then, because Everett was an interesting man to work with, he then said to me, look, I've got this really good job for you. He said, the Australian farming community are really sick of the government and want to fight tariffs. So they set up a thing called the Australian Farmers Fighting Fund. I then went and spent the next 12 months working in Canberra with Andrew Robb, who's now the Trade Minister, and Ian McLaughlin, a former Defence Minister, was the Chairman of the NFF. And we ran this fund, which was really a train-the-trainer program, so right up my military alley. Uh, and we set up a tally room, remember the Carlton Walsh report, those of you who are old enough, used to be the, uh, the late line on ABC TV years ago. And uh, we set that up in the NFF headquarters and we had people phone in from all over Australia, a bit like the Miss Australia thing. And the upshot was we raised 12.8 million against a target of 10 that was phoned in and by the time I finished we'd passed 20 million. Sir so Charles Court was the chairman of the thing. I mean I'm not trying to make this sound easy, it was damn hard work and a lot of travel, but it was a very interesting exercise because it was really the fundamental principles which I'll finish off with in a, in a couple of minutes. That Everall then said, well that's okay, you've done very well in Australia, how about you go to England now and see how good you are in England? Well it's very handy having a father who uh, had uh, a very senior Royal Naval rank and a British passport, even though I had a funny Australian accent. Because I really flourished in England. The uh, Horton General Hospital uh, campaign we did for the A&E unit was a major su success because there's some very, very uh, good people in the community that really wanted this hospital to succeed and to survive. Uh, so it was a matter of identifying what the needs analysis was. And the need was that to go from those days before the M40 motorway open from Banbury to Oxford was on a, a double lane road, one lane each way, uh, could take you 45 to 50 minutes to get to the major hospital uh, in, in Oxford and you'd probably be dead by then if you were in a car accident. So they wanted to keep the A&E open. 
I then became managing director after that success of that company and held that role for the next few years, uh, where we became known as the cathedral fundraisers in the UK. We kept our business going here. We did a lot of work in South Africa, particularly in the political arena with the uh, Progressive Federal Party, which was the official opposition there. But the main thing we did was most of the major cathedrals fundraising campaigns in the UK, which is not bad for a Toowoomba-born fellow, Everell Compton, and his little company that ran out of Zilmere in those days. But we actually developed quite a reputation, and a number of my former consultants and staff are still working in England. They married people and got to know people over there and have made their lives there. And so we, we are quite well regarded uh, in that, particularly in the cathedral precinct, and that led us into universities, which is where I went next, as Steve alluded to in his notice. I, I spent uh, a year at QUT, or QIT as it was then, and, and ran a very successful development operation, got involved in other aspects of university management. When that finished, Dennis Gibson, who's the long-serving VC and sort of very good friend of that, Geraldine's and mine, said, I've said, told ACU, Australian Catholic University, they need you. So I went there for a year and stayed for seven. At that point, rose to the rank of Pro Vice-Chancellor, because uh, I took it as a career thing rather than being an external consultant. Pro Vice Chancellor is, is the Vice the Chancellor is the non-paid head of the board, chairman of the board. Vice Chancellor is the managing director. Under that, there's the board of directors, which are normally these days called Pro Vice Chancellors. Carl Rawlings, who's my friend here in Toowoomba, uh, he's Pro Vice Chancellor students or something out at uh, USQ. Um, I really found the university world, in spite of academics, and that by this stage. I'd been married to one for quite some time, um, to be quite fascinating. Organisationally, universities are a, a thing that varies from herding cats to highly intelligent, very, very clever people who just need to know how to run a business, and most of them don't. Um, so when I finished at ACU and uh, I decided my philosophy is if you do five years in that sort of role, you've really run out of puff. You start doing the same thing each year. And in fairness to the organisation now, they convinced me to stay at ACU for nearly eight years, but I then moved on and I moved on to Bond. Uh, and that, again, was a headhunted thing where the Vice-Chancellor there talked to the Vice-Chancellor. It's very incestuous universities. They all chat to each other. So I found myself working at Bond, living on the Gold Coast, and six months later, Geraldine went there as the head of the Institute of Education that they were starting up. I found universities fascinating, as I said, for, for the personnel reasons, for what they were doing, and, and the potential that the silly buggers didn't realise they had. And Bond was very different, because Bond, we got no government money. We had to live off our wits and what we recruited as students because the only income we had, other than contract research, was from student fees. And I ran student recruitment. We revolutionised that. We changed the whole structure. And the way I did that, and Dave will know this from his work, is I listened to what the staff in that department wanted to do. The first thing I did was met with them all. I brought them together and it had been the first time they'd ever been together at Bond was always considered too expensive. So we actually got someone to sponsor them to fly up. And we had a week workshop where I asked them, how are you going to make me look good and improve my career prospects? And that was really what it was. Because they were the people doing the work out in the regions. We only had seven of them covering the whole of Australia. And they were the total lifeblood of the organisation. They were constantly being berated by academics of all levels for being useless and all this sort of thing and the wrong sort of applicants and, you know, terrible sort of nonsense. So I then set about turning that round. I was a member of the executive group, so I could do that. I had the access. And as I moved through that, I took on the role for the last three years I was at Bond of being the effective 2IC of the university and not, not an academic, which I thought was a big asset. Uh, along the way, I picked up a couple of qualifications, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, but I don't worry much about communication. I'll never put them on cards or anything because I just think they're a way of broadening your horizons. My simple philosophy in life, uh, which I then portrayed as I sort of moved into semi-retirement uh, uh, from, from the UK, because when we left Bond, Geraldine and I moved to the United Kingdom, she was moving to the zenith of her career as Pro Vice-Chancellor Academic at Worcester University, 
which he was headhunted to. So I went along and became chairman of a company called Global Philanthropic, which is an international fundraising firm. Uh, I did that for the period we were there, but on the 7th of July, whatever year it was, Geraldine was at Edgware Road when the bomb went off and came home to Worcester finally a day and a half later and said, uh, we're leaving England, I don't want to stay here anymore, and I respected that. We moved from England directly back to King Island, which most of you know, I've had an interest in King Island for some time. Found King Island fascinating. I there turned my hand to being the manager of an abattoir, which I didn't have a lot of background in, but uh, the principles which I'll leave with you right at the end, uh, I think it will indicate how I did that. I found it absolutely fascinating. Geraldine worked as a checkout chick on IGA until she got a phone call from the University of Tasmania one day, Vice-Chancellor. Pro Vice Chancellor, yeah, Pro and in, yeah, in King Island she was a checkout chick at IGA. And, and I ran the abattoir. <coughs> Both part time jobs, our retirement jobs, we retired to King Island, but we're the sort of people who have to be active. Uh, the abattoir was wonderful. We started at four in the morning. I was home generally by one. I had a 16 foot boat and a 30 horsepower Yamaha and a good mate next door, and we'd go out diving for crayfish. and. Abalone, we actually got sick of eating crayfish in abalone. You had to go off it for periods of time because you just got literally sick of it because the island is a paradise. But Geraldine then, her career wasn't over and that became obvious, so we moved to Tassie. We spent three years in Tassie where she was Dean of Education for the University of Tasmania. She then got headhunted by Peter Hoy, who's now the Vice-Chancellor of UQ, to uh, uh, go to uh, University of South Australia where he was VC. We were, on the, we were on the Danube River on a river cruiser surrounded by ice doing the Christmas markets on a 21 day cruise and she got a phone call from Peter Hoy himself asking her would she consider the role. She said yes. She st we went back and she started in the February. Um, similar thing happened with ACU so I'm now the sort of house husband and uh, keeping things ticking over here in Toowoomba. I dabble a bit. I did my thing with the Quolls in South Australia where I managed the relationships between the WA and South Australian government, or established the relationship and then managed it to put breeding families of Quolls into the Flinders Ranges, which they've just done the second release. And Landline, if you watch Landline, they, every six weeks they have an update on what the Quolls are doing in the Flinders Ranges. That was one of the things we negotiated. I, Two minutes, right? I live uh, here in Toowoomba now and love it. And the principles that I've been alluding to is that the things you need, in my view, to succeed in any avenue, and I've listened to some of your other talks, and this same thing's come out in each of those, is attention to detail, people handling skills, and finally, in my case, marry well because I can now do what I want to do as a kept man. <laughs>